Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Aaron Blade and I'm the editor, creator, and producer of what you're watching right now, Blade Talk. If you are new here, welcome and you find this presentation helpful, informative, do me a huge favor and hit that like button, do me an even greater favor and subscribe to my channel. Always appreciate all the support that I am given. So here we are in the um, second part of a three-part series and in this presentation I'm going to be going over the three major responses to the Enlightenment in the 19th century. Okay, um, I'm also going to cover and touch on what went on in the 20th century as well. So again as always if you have not seen the previous presentation that i did on um the enlightenment i encourage you to stop here and go check that out so you're all caught up for the rest of us let's hit that intro and let's begin All right, so here we are continuing on with part two in this series, okay? Looking at the major changes that occurred in Jewish in the Jewish world, all right? We talked about the, uh, the changes or the split that happened in Eastern Europe between the Hasidim and the Misnagdim, right? Now, it's important to remember that though this split happened with the rise of the Hasidic movement and the opposition, which was uh, the Misnagdim, there was still no debate on the Jewish role in the world, okay? And what our goal was in terms of maintaining our end of the covenant and getting back to our Holy Land, okay? In Western Europe, because we are so close to the Enlightenment, the responses are going to be much more dramatic, all right? There is a breach in the Jewish people as it pertains to Judaism as a whole, all right? Jews in Western Europe seeing their identity and their role in the world essentially shift, okay? So there were three responses to the Enlightenment in Western Europe from a Jewish perspective, okay? The first is conversion. Many Jews just converted out. They were so enthusiastic about this new world of opportunity, and they were so tired of the persecution and suffering that they endured just for being Jewish that they chose to convert out. In Germany alone, there were over 30% of Jews that converted. We even had famous uh, converts become uh, very prominent in different societies. For example, Benjamin Disraeli became the prime minister of England. Then we have Karl Marx, his family converted when he was just six years old. Now, you would eventually go on to become an atheist, and he basically stated that uh, religion is the opium of the masses. Then there was Heinrich Hein, who was one of, if not the greatest, uh, figure of German literature in the 19th century. So watching these Jews that converted out and achieved success inspired many Jews to follow suit. Again, our little things have changed uh, since we started worshiping celebrities, right? In any event, it is important to point out that Jews didn't convert because they were endorsing the tenets of Christianity, right? It wasn't that they were you know, excited believers. Rather, they seen conversion as a ticket into European society, this is their chance to participate in the modern world and achieve success. Now, many Jews were starting to worry that we were losing Jews so rapidly to conversion that we would go extinct. This led to the second response, which is Reform Judaism. Now, the goal of this movement was to keep the next generation of Jews in the fold and not to see more Jews convert out. So when people say that, that 
the reform uh, movement is an assimilation movement. This is incorrect. Jews were leaving on mass, and Reformed Judaism gave Jews an opportunity to maintain their Jewish identity. I would argue that it is actually an anti-assimilation movement. And I always like to draw this caveat because people are quick to judge the reform movement when in actuality, over 30% of Jews just in Germany were converting out. And in the Orthodox or traditional sects, there was a split with the rise of Hasidic or Hasidim, right? As I stated, the Vilna Goen were excommunicating Jews that followed the Hasidic movement. So it wasn't as if uh, traditional or Orthodox Jews were uh, clear in their vision either. All right? We were all uh, struggling with how to deal with the Enlightenment period. So getting back to Reform Judaism, non-Jews seen themselves as being part of a nation that shared a land, history, and a culture together. And many Jews wanted to participate and prove they that they were uh, nationalistic as well okay the thinkers of reform judaism came up with the idea that the torah was in fact not given by god but had multiple different authors they also removed the nationalistic concept from judaism which makes perfect sense at the time right they tried to prove to uh, the Germans or the French or wherever they lived that they were equally French or German or uh, uh, citizen of whatever country that they were living in. They also discounted the idea of the Jewish people being a distinct nation of Israel. Okay, So there was no longer a focus on returning back to the land of Israel, building a temple, uh, Hebrew was no longer being used in services, but rather they prayed in the language of the country they were living in. They also modeled the prayer services of that of their uh, Protestant counterparts, right? They had a choir, an organ playing, and even switched Shabbat to Sunday to be in line with, uh, again, their Christian counterparts, right? They also started to call their synagogues temples because they wanted to show they were no longer dreaming of a temple of Jerusalem. Now, before I dive into the third response, I want to point out that this is early Reformed Judaism. Okay, this is not Reformed Judaism as we know it today. The Reformed movement went through a metamorphosis after World War II. You see, many people thought, many Jews thought that if they abandon uh, rituals and certain traditions, that uh, the world would essentially accept us, okay? The rise of anti-Semitism and the Holocaust proved that uh, the movement, in theory, you know, wasn't exactly accurate in their decision, okay? So the reform movement in response brought back many of the things that they let go of, okay? So the reform movement today, um, Shabbat is back on its uh, its correct day. Uh, they observe the holidays. They move to incorpor incorporating a little bit more Hebrew. They are, for the most part, um, a Zionist, etc. So keep in mind that what I am describing is the early reform Judaism when Jews were just desperate to be a part of society. And so it's easy for people of today to judge them based on their actions. But keep in mind that you're living at a time where it isn't looked down upon to be Jewish. You know, we have our own struggles and everything isn't perfect by any means, but we have a nation now um, that didn't, you know, called Israel. And we have the United States, the richest, most powerful nation on earth as its main ally. So it's easy to claim now that Jews should have kept their traditions instead of giving it up. And I can't believe that uh, the reform movement would would abandon their identity, et cetera, et cetera. But I always, again, like to draw that caveat because they were getting persecuted. 
okay, for centuries. Just for being Jewish, they were stuck in ghettos. They couldn't get ahead, all right? So it's easy for, again, the Jews of today to look back and say, oh my gosh, why would you do that? They wanted a better life, okay? So I know that it is forbidden for a Jew to judge another Jew. So I refuse to do it, right? I refuse to, you know, because who knows what we would have done in light of those circumstances. People just wanted a better life. They wanted to exist. They wanted to, um, you know, maximize uh, their full potential, use their gifts, whether they could sing or dance or whatever without the the pressure of facing, you know, anti-Semitism, right? So again, I choose not to judge, um, judge them based on this, the decisions that they made, right? So again, you know, there are always some arrogant Jews that, you know, the reform movement is this or it's that or whatever the case may be. And the thing is, is none of us have it right, okay? Whether you're Reconstructionist, Reform, Conservative, Orthodox, nobody has it right. And we're all fairly new trying to um, adapt to this Enlightenment period, okay? None of us have it 100% right. And my wish, my goal, is that we at least respect each other as Jews, right? Because in the face of anti-Semitism, it doesn't matter which kind of Jew you are. And the Reform Movement, um, you know, abandoned a lot of things. But as we'll go through in part three, with the rise of anti-Semitism again, it essentially didn't matter. Right? And... When the Holocaust and other tragedies take place, the reform movement essentially corrects a lot of the things that it initially uh, put out there, right? So it moved back to, you know, um, being Zionist. They brought Shabbat back on the correct day. Um, they brought back the holidays, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, right? So the reform movement as we know it today, is actually um, coming back to tradition, right? So, again, far be it for me to judge other Jews, especially at a time that, you know, and the circumstances that they found themselves in. You know, they didn't have their own nation called Israel at that time. They didn't have the most powerful nation on earth backing them and was a great ally to the Jewish people, right? So be mindful when you are, you know, be mindful of that when you are, you know, um, you know, looking at the Jews of that time, all right? Now let's get back to it. The third major response was a movement called Torah with Culture, okay? This was founded by Rabbi Samson Hirsch. He was a leading rabbi in Germany and a main uh, proponent of traditional Judaism. He rallied against the reform movement, claiming that there is no conflict between Torah and being part of the modern society that we're living in. The goal is that the Torah should be the centerpiece of one's life. The Torah is timeless, and we, as we move through the ages, we are meant to bring the wisdom of the Torah to the ages that we are living in. So he wrote many books, one of them being the Horeb, which he explains uh, the meaning and depth behind Torah tradition in an effort to get Jews to maintain their commitment. 
So these are the three responses to the Enlightenment in Western Europe in the 19th century. Okay. So I covered the Jewish response to the Enlightenment um, in Eastern Europe and Western Europe. But now there is another major player in the world. Okay. The United States has emerged. So from the United States emerged two more movements, which were conservative Judaism founded in 1886 and reconstructionist Judaism founded much later in 1968. Now to better understand these movements, I want to go back to Germany with what was going on with the reform movement, which I touched on, right? I want to clarify some of the beliefs because conservative Judaism is really a response and reaction to how far Jews wanted to uh, essentially go in reform Judaism. Okay, so talking about the reform movement, the grandfather was a man named Moses Mendelssohn. Okay, he was the one that essentially introduced that religion should be rational. Okay, meaning if there was a conflict or something that didn't make sense to us, then what made sense to us should take precedent. Okay, now he would never publicly reject the Torah or the oral tradition, uh, but something that indicates a flaw in his knowledge is that four of his six children converted to Christianity. All right. The second major figure in the reform movement was a rabbi named Abraham Geiger, okay, who was much more outspoken. He said at the first uh, rabbinical conference that the Talmud must go. And the Bible, that collection of mostly uh, so beautiful and exalted human books as divine work, must also go. So he was very radical in his beliefs. When Reformed Jews come to the United States, they're going to take progressive measures which are met with a strong reaction and uncomfortability amongst Jews who also want to see Judaism change, but not like this. Now, it's important to point out that at this point, there are only two movements in the United States. There are the Reformed Jews from Germany, and traditional Jews, which became known as Orthodox. Now, Orthodox was a label the Reformed Jews gave the traditional Jews to imply that they were backwards and essentially out of date. Now, in the Reformed camp, there was a wide range, okay? So don't assume that uh, in the Reform movement, everyone was just so progressive. There were, there were some uh, in the Reform movement that still maintained uh, that traditional uh, Jewish lifestyle and that j traditional Jewish thought, okay? So you still had Jews in the Reform movement that were traditional leaning. Now, this was up until the Reform movement decided to do two provocative things uh, to essentially smoke out the more traditional element, right? The first is an event known as the Trefa Banquet of 1883. The banquet was celebrating the graduating class of Reform rabbis in the United States. It was the first graduating class. At this banquet, they broke every single or almost every single uh, dietary prohibition. Okay, they ate crab, uh, shrimp salad, frog legs. They had um, dairy dessert right after eating meat, etc. Now there is some speculation that uh, there was a mistake, and in, in the catering. The caterer was anti-Semitic and, you know, they decided to uh, essentially do that because it is well known that the person, the president of this college was actually 
uh, he actually kept kosher himself. He was actually married to an Orthodox or a traditional Jew, right? So it's really unknown um, what essentially happened uh, at that banquet in terms of what the intentions were. However, what wasn't um, unknown or what we do know is that um, some of the more progressive Jews decided to eat um, the the frog legs and the shrimp salad, etc., etc., and this was very provocative, and many of the Jews essentially stormed out. Okay, the second provocative thing that they did was the Pittsburgh Platform of 1885 where the reform movement laid down central elements of its doctrine. The first is that only moral laws were binding on the Jewish people. All the ritual laws, for example, the dietary laws, were rejected. They also stated that the Jewish people are not a nation, but a religious community. Now, many people don't know this, but the reform movement was actually anti-Zionist as well. Uh, again, this makes sense as they were trying to prove to their non-Jewish uh, uh, contemporaries that they were uh, nationalistic. Okay. So it was these two events that was the catalyst for uh, conservative Judaism, which opened up the Jewish Theological Seminary in 1886. Now, again, as I've stated, you know, in the beginning stages of the conservative movement, again, we are looking at um, its founding at the beginning stages. It was basically orthodox or modern orthodox, right? JTS was originally an orthodox yeshiva. Not many people know that the Jewish Theological Seminary um, had many orthodox rabbis that graduated from there. Right. So let's dive into the belief system of conservative Judaism at this time. First of all, they believed in the tradition, the traditional notion of the Jewish God, the God of the universe. And um, they had um, been a part of the covenant with God and God appeared at Har Sinai. It was a very traditional approach in the way that uh, conservative Jews view God. They also adhere to halakha or Jewish law. Okay, they didn't abandon Jewish law. They still felt that Jewish law was binding. Next, they believed that there were uh, positive ideas that came from our history that they wanted to maintain, mainly the traditions. Okay. That was what it meant to be a conservative Jew. They were conserving the traditions and the rituals that centered around being Jewish. Finally, they believed in adapting to the times that we were living in. So basically, we are bound by uh, Torah and Jewish law. But when times change, we see those changes through the lens of Torah and Jewish law, and we adapt accordingly. Okay, And many conservative Jews believe that that's the way Judaism always was. Um, you know, But there are um, other parts or movements of Judaism that believe that, no, 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 we're going to freeze Judaism or we're going to try to freeze it in time just like it is in the you know, the 1800s or, you know, the early 1900s. And that's the way Judaism should be practiced throughout the rest of time. They're, you know, trying to essentially freeze time. And then there are other parts or movements of Judaism that uh, essentially believe that we should be ahead of the curve. We should be ahead of time, essentially, so to speak, right? We should be um, leading the charge into um, you know, uh, the changing world that we live in. Okay. Then there was the Reconstructionist movement. Okay. Now, Reconstructionist Jews were actually a break away from the conservative movement. 
There was a rabbi at the Jewish Theological Seminary whose name was Mordecai Kaplan. Now, he had ideas that were different from what was taught there, so he went off on his own and started a new movement in 1968. Now, Reconstructionist Judaism is a very small uh, Jewish community, but the basic tenets are that he didn't believe in a revealed God. He didn't believe that God would interact with people or enter a covenant with people. He rejected the idea that God would dialogue with people. He rejected this interaction between creator and creation. He also stated that Judaism was a civilization. He didn't believe our laws were morally binding. Instead, they were rituals that were more cultural. So we should follow them and do the commandments because you're part of the civilization and culture. So therefore, it's a good thing uh, to be culturally in tune with your civilization, unless you have a you know specific reason not to. He didn't see a moral obligation to keep our laws. Reconstructionist Judaism is kind of like a hybrid between reform and conservative. There is no moral basis for keeping any of the laws, yet there is a desire to keep tradition, even though not to traditional notions of God, but you should do things because this is our civilization, even though there is no meaning or absolute value to essentially doing any of them okay so that in a nutshell is the are the responses to um, the enlightenment period in the um, 18th century eastern europe which i covered in part one and this presentation part two i covered uh, the 18th and 19th uh, century i'm sorry 19th and 20th century um, we're looking at western europe uh, reaction to the Enlightenment as well as the United States um, now that that has come into play. So these were the responses to the Enlightenment and we are still essentially working, you know, those kinks and what whatnot out today uh, from that Enlightenment period. No movement, no Jewish movement today is more than 300 years old. Okay, so we're all just basically doing the best we can. And I don't come on this platform and say that we should all be one movement. You know, we should all be unified, you know, and things like that. Because I know that won't happen until the Mashiach comes. Okay, I think that part of our exile, part of our punishment is that we are scattered right? We are confused. We are um, lost, right? This is part of our um, our punishment. So I can't sit here and say that uh, the Orthodox has it right, or the Conservatives has it right, or the Reform. We're all reactionary movements responding to the Enlightenment, right? My hope, again, is that we respect each other as Jews, though. You know, I don't like the the idea that, you know, some Jews view other Jews as not Jewish. They try to strip them of their identity, right? Because as I said, anti-Semites, they really don't care. And in a world where anti-semitism is alive and well we need every jew that we can get right we need to essentially respect each other again we're not all going to going to think the same and as i've always stated you know i don't believe that there are reformed jews i don't believe that there are Orthodox Jews. I hate the artificial labels that we place upon ourselves. There are Jews that practice reform. There are Jews that practice orthodoxly. There are Jews that practice conservative. Right? But the idea that you were born 
you know, a Reformed Jew or an Orthodox Jew or is something in your genetic makeup, right, that makes you Orthodox, that, that, that makes no sense to me, right? So I reject that 100%. My goal is that we can have a healthy exchange of ideas, right? But again, be anchored in Torah and Jewish law. So, you know, again, I'm a conservative Jew. Right? I feel like the reform movement, um, you know, they're still Jews and I don't judge them. You know, my hope is that they will come around to and they have to uh, coming back to tradition. You know, some even go as far as to say that Jewish law is binding. So they're essentially coming back. Right. And then the Orthodox movement, you know, um, when I was a part of it, you see certain things being added to Jewish law in terms of going too far. For example, someone comes to convert, you turn them away three times. And well, that, that's not Jewish law. Right. So some ortho in the orthodox camp are adding to um jewish law in order to make it so exclusive but in doing so you know at the rate people are leaving uh judaism and now you want to make it hard for people to come back into the fold right or people that because i think that judaism one of the beautiful things about it is the fact that we have converts i think that that is amazing right it it really shines a different light and adds a new perspective on how judaism is viewed from the outside right and we can learn a lot from converts right so the idea that we make it hard for them or they need to study for years and years and years, that makes no sense to me. And I, I don't agree with that. Right. I do believe, obviously, you should know what you're getting into. Um, Rabbi, I should test that convert sincerity in terms of, you know, do you know about anti-Semitism? Do you know about our laws? Right, the more strenuous, the more strict laws, and the less strict laws. But the halakha explicitly states that we don't dive in too deep in terms of laws. Don't go too deep, lest you turn someone from a good path to a bad path. Right, it literally says that in Jewish law. So, my hope is that, again, we respect each other's viewpoints. Because we're all just trying to adapt while we're in exile. We're, all not, going, we're not all going to uh, see eye to eye. Right? But my hope is, is that, as I've stated in the conservative movement... My hope is that, you know, we can agree to disagree and walk away respecting each other as Jews instead of tearing other Jews down. Again, it's all about which way you're trending or which way you are uh, going. Are you bringing out the best of yourself are you helping out you know people that may not be where you are are you looking down on them All right so you know that that's my um hope for you know the jewish people right and i love being jewish i absolutely love it All right I just want to be able to have exchange and dialogue, 
difference of ideas and interpretations, and I think that it's good. I I welcome that. Right? As I stated, I don't believe in the the um, Kabbalistic notion that someone has a Jewish soul or you know whatnot. I believe that. I want to attribute if a convert comes, I don't necessarily believe that they have a, they always had a Jewish soul. I believe that they're very intelligent because the more I attribute it to their soul and their spirit, I don't know what they, I don't even know what a soul is comprised of except a divine element. Right? I can't see that. I don't know what your soul or what's written in your spirit or anything like that. But if someone comes to convert to Judaism, what I can say is that you're an intelligent person and I give you credit. Because you made the decision based on new information to change course. And the more that people claim that, you know... Well, that person always had a Jewish soul. So let me ask you something then. What happens when you have to tell, you know, we have to be very careful because what happens if it's used in the opposite way? Someone chooses not to convert someone because they don't see that quote unquote Jewish soul, right? Now you're rejecting people because you think that you can see inside someone's soul. So, you have to be very careful with, you know, um, thinking we know a person's soul or spirit and whatnot. Right? Judge people by their actions. Okay? It's the, the deeds that essentially shape the heart. And I welcome anyone. Like I said, we're all just doing the best we can. We are meant to be lost. We are meant to be confused. The age of prophecy is over until the Mashiach comes, right? But again, I want to emphasize that let's respect each other's viewpoints right i want more dialogue between reform jews and orthodox jews and chabad jews and uh conservative jews and uh haredi jews and reconstructionist jews instead of dismissing them because in the end we're all we got we are all we have So, that being said, thank you all so much for tuning in to Blade Talk. If you found this presentation helpful, informative, do me a huge favor and hit that like button. Do me an even greater favor and subscribe to my channel. Always appreciate all the support that I am given. Thank you all so much. Um, be sure to, again, like and subscribe so you get notified when I post uh, part three of this series. Looking at the Jewish response to the Enlightenment. Again, thank you all so much. Be good to yourselves. Be good to others. And until the next episode, you all take care.